Julie? No public questions. And we've got apologies okay. from Aileen. Aileen, OK, thank you. Declarations of any other business? Declarations of interest? Minutes of the meeting, any corrections? 5.1. No, uh, the action log and matters arising all seem to be in hand or completed. So unless someone's got something else to raise. OK. Um, in which case, um, I'll hand over to you, Debbie, and to introduce Jade Hens. Is that right? Welcome, It is Jade. right. And I've <laughs> I just texted her to say, feel free to join, because <laughs> I was thinking <laughs> I was going to be doing the presentation, which wouldn't have gone down well. So, <laughs> so glad to see you, Jade. Um, Jade is here to talk about the mental health support team and getting help um, in our young people's services today. It's a relatively new initiative so um hopefully you'll find it um an interesting presentation okay That's it. Thank, Over you, Jay. thank you martin morning everyone um i do have some slides that i'll share with everyone um and then i can i can distribute it round afterwards if if people are happy to um let me just see if it's going to give me permission to share And we can everyone see. Can see that. Perfect. Yeah. Good. Hopefully it's all working. Um, perfect. So my name is Jade Hens. I am the CAMS team lead for the Getting Help and Mental Health Support Teams for Slough. Um, so make up part of East Berkshire. So East Berkshire CAMS team is Slough, Bracknell and then Royal um, Borough of Windsor and Maidenhead, which Ascot also sit within. So although we call them RBWM, you may also see them as WAM, W-A-M. So we're just going to be talking about a patient journey that we had within our MHST or mental health support team. Um, there are obviously quite a lot of acronyms in the NHS. So if I say any that you're unfamiliar with, please do um, butt in and um, I can clarify that for you. So um, if you're not familiar with um, the Thrive model, um, this details the five needs based groupings for uh, children, young people and families. So our service, as you can see by the lovely big green arrow, sits within the Getting Help quadrant. Um, and this is sort of early intervention, mild to moderate presentations. Um, and our aim really is to get the sort of the children, young person or family into that yellow thriving section. Um, the getting more help um, is our CAM specialist team. So if they're not appropriate for our getting help service, um, the early intervention services, then it would be stepped up to getting more help. And that's where you'll find the anxiety disorder treatment team, rapid response um, and also like specialist community teams as well. So I have three teams that sit within my remit. I have two mental health support teams or MHSTs um, as as I call them, and then one getting help team. So the threshold and interventions for all of my teams are the same, but the mental health support teams are school based, so they deliver their interventions predominantly in the school, um, unless that sort of child or, or family request otherwise. And then my getting help team is community based, so they work out of our base at Fir Tree House at Upton Hospital, um, and they would see people that would be referred from, say, like GPs, places of worship. The local authority, etc. Whereas MHST, um, it would be school referrals. So this is just a little bit of a structure of our team. Um, as you can see, we do have a little bit of vacancy, so that's why there are stars next to them. They were either waiting for recruitment to sort of recruit them, um, but this is what we would look like if we're fully staffed. So we have um, education mental health practitioners who are our clinicians or we call them EMPs for short. We obviously have team administrators, uh, senior mental health practitioners, senior clinicians and supervisors and then also senior EMPs. And then just about our getting help team. So um, we have children wellbeing practitioners. So again, the the qualification is the same as the EMPs. It's just that the EMPs would do an extra module about working in schools and that whole school approach. Um, but the interventions um, and the thresholds um, are exactly the same, essentially. Um, we do have some trainees um, in service at the moment. Um, and then we have um, a very new role, uh, which we're just recruiting for, haven't yet started. And that's the 
senior mental health practitioner for GP primary care. So essentially, they'll be working 50% in our getting help team and then 50% in the actual GP practices um, within Slough. It's currently being piloted um, by WAM or RBWM um, and it's, it's sort of quite successful at the moment. So just a little bit um, on our service background, um, there is a link at the bottom for further information about our MHST as it's a government um, initiative. So there's, as you can imagine, there's quite a lot of information um, on there, um, but it's it's based on the green paper of transforming children and young people's mental health provision. And the aim is for every school um, and college to have a designated mental health lead by 2025. So as I mentioned before, we do make up three localities and Slough is just one of those lo localities. We have had the MHST support team one um, since about 2019 but really sort of fully operational by 2020 and then our second team MHST two just to keep it nice and simple um, joined the team sort of in 21 um, slash 22 so we tend to do the recruitment then they do their year's worth of training so then we're fully operational by the year after. Um, so across the two MHSTs, we're in 24 schools, which is about 47% coverage, um, and then the remaining schools fall within our Getting Help team, which we call the non-MHST schools, just for um, simplicity. So our offer, so we offer both direct and indirect interventions. So as I mentioned earlier, we are early intervention um, for mild to moderate mental health interventions. We offer one to one support for the actual sort of child or young person if they're sort of 12 years and over or primary school, um, uh, sorry, secondary school um, over about six to eight sessions, depending on what the intervention is that we offered. Um, and then we do parent led interventions for anyone sort of 11 years or under so that primary school age um, the reason why we do that is sometimes you know they're not going to necessarily have that emotional maturity so working with a five-year-old could be very very difficult with the interventions that we offer so we tend to work with the parent because the parent knows the child best would know their triggers would know their behaviors would know how that they would react which is why um, we do the parent-led interventions as well if the child is say in year six and has that emotional capacity then we would work directly um, with that young person but it's 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 really done on a, a sort of a individual case depending on the child um, and then we we can do small group sessions where we feel um, it's appropriate we then do the indirect interventions so that's things like multi-agency triaging so we work very closely with um, the MASH team with the local authority when it's our getting help team um, we do school staff consultations and reflective practice so we have what we call a uh, school surgery every six to eight weeks um, they meet with the school um, just talk through open referrals talk through potential referrals um, and then if, if there's any advice or any guidance we need to give then we will um, uh, we do a lot of joined up working with professionals, so local authority, like I mentioned, in schools, um, places of worship, etc. Anywhere really out in the community or school based, we will work with them. We also do training workshops, uh, coffee mornings, open, open days, open evenings, um, really anywhere that we can kind of get in and be helpful for everyone we will we will do that and then we're also trained in um, pep care so that's psychological perspectives in education and primary care um, which is kind of an add-on free training um, available for everyone I have put the website link um, just down below in case um, people haven't heard of that so as we're an early intervention, mild to moderate presentation service, these are some of the presenting problems we can offer interventions for. I won't read them out, but it is sort of very sort of quite low level. So it's low level um, sort of CBT that we offer, almost like self-help guided um, type skills. Um, so things like simple phobias, so singular phobia as we call it so if it's just dogs or it's heights or it's separation anxiety if there's you know more complicated phobias that would then be um, specialist cams and it would need to be escalated up 
And then what we don't support with, um, so anything that kind of falls within this remit, we would recommend that the referrer would go to um, the common point of entry or CPE for a referral into specialist CAM. So anxiety disorders treatment team, as I mentioned earlier, or the specialist community team. Now, if a referral is not accepted, um, then we can support the referrer to explore where maybe better or more appropriate for that child, young person or family to go to. So we never just flat out say no we say they're not you know maybe appropriate for our team because of x y and z but actually what we would recommend is and then with our recommendations so moving on to a uh, patient journey case study, which I guess is why I'm why I'm here. Um, so this is a case that we had in our MHST2 team. Uh, the clinician was Evie Brooks. So if you see the name Evie, then it is my clinician. It is not the patient's name. Um, I've just called them patient X for the sake of um, this case study. And she did a really fantastic job um, with this family as um, I'll go over the feedback a little bit later on. So just a little bit of background information. So the child was eight years old. Uh, male and then attended a SEN school, a special education needs school, um, as he had a diagnosis of ASD and awaiting an ADHD assessment. Um, so we did parent led work for this one because of his age. So the reason for referral was concerns around sort of food avoidance, fears of sitting down or being dirty, uh, social worries about appearance, particularly whilst eating. And then other information that we were given at the time was that the parent was quite apprehensive um, about the child attending the initial assessment um, and then any further sessions just because he'd never engaged with the service before. That sort of lack of trust in professionals um, was, was really quite high and quite anxiety provoking for him. So. Because um, the child had a diagnosis of ASD and pending ADHD assessment and with mum's concerns that he may not engage, it was necessary to put in sort of reasonable adjustments to try and make the assessment as successful and as engaging as possible. Um, otherwise, we may not have been able to offer that support because if we if we can't do the assessment, then we can't then sort of then follow through on what would be the most appropriate um, intervention for for the family. So we had a Pokemon style assessment to try and increase that engagement. So he was very, very um, into Pokemon um, and Evie actually has some Pokemon converses that she wore. So just as a way of just trying to be a bit more relatable um, to to that little boy. Um, and um, he did he did really enjoy the shoes um, and Pokemon cards were provided by mum secretly exchanged to Evie so then he thought that Evie was you know handing him over the cards and just a way of just building that trust and building that relationship um because it meant that he then went away thinking oh god look I've got someone who who loves Pokemon just as much as me and Evie does you know she does actually really like Pokemon so um this was all completely true all completely relatable <clears throat> for him so the first assessment um, did go ahead um, the clinical room, unfortunately, was too hot and too small um, for him to be able to cope. So they did have to um, reschedule. But then she made sure that for the rescheduled assessment um, that she sourced a different room and just made sure that it accommodated sort of more space um, and had, you know, less temperature concerns, shall we say. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to Fir Tree House, but it can be quite warm there in the clinical rooms. So after the assessment, the intervention um, identified um, would be a parent led intervention because of his age, um, which is called helping your child with fears and worries or HYC, as we call it. Um, and this provides the parents with sort of an understanding of their child's anxiety and how maybe sometimes the parent's anxiety can also be influenced in this. Um, so they were sort of focusing on those anxious behaviours around eating and drinking, particularly um, in front of other people um, and with attending school not eating or drinking is obviously quite a difficult thing so uh, the helping your child looks at increasing independence allowing children to build that confidence and just through learning how to cope with everything those strategies um, and being able to sort of sit with that anxiety and actually work work through it um, so parents are taught to be curious, um, gather anxious expectations from their children, um, as opposed to sort of providing closed off reassurance or sort of, um, you know, accidentally sort of 
almost squashing it as it were. So at each step, parents are encouraged to reflect on their child's learning um, and they're taught to encourage and problem solve against any barriers with their child. So this is very sort of collaborative. So although Evie was doing the parental intervention with the parent, the parent would then go away and take what they've learned from Evie to then apply and work with the child. So the outcome. So in total, um, Evie did actually manage to complete a psychoeducation session with um, with X, which is a real surprise to us. And, um, and it just goes to show the impact that assessment had that he was actually willing to have a session with her. So the psychoeducation session was around food, around eating um, and drinking um, and just that sort of that appearance to other people. And then Evie completed four one hour sessions two 30 minute phone calls and one one hour review with the parent themselves. So as a result, the positive impact was really, really significant. Family are now confident in going out together, doing things, and they've even planned a holiday because he now will eat and drink in front of other people. School obviously reported huge improvements um, and good behaviour in school. Will now sit in some situation and has been able to go on school trips, which is really, really amazing because he was really missing out on a lot of things um, from, from having this anxiety. Um, attendance at school has improved. Um, he's attending on time and limited sort of anxiety most days. So he's able to kind of cope in school now, which is which is just amazing. Um, has snacks in lessons during the school day and he no longer shares a bed with mum, which I'm sure mum is also very <laughs> pleased about as well. So I've just highlighted um, some of the quotes um that I sort of pulled out from the feedback um but Deb Debbie did ask if I could read it out to you so I will read it out to you um and then I've also attached it to the slide so if you do want the slides you can read it in full as well so the, the feedback mentions obviously feedback for Evie, of course, um, but it also does mention feedback for our admin team and also the staff at Fir Tree House, um, which is really, really lovely. So I'm just going to read it out um, and I don't think I'm going to be able to share it because the way that I'm sharing the PowerPoint. So um, if you want to call out or anything, please just do because I won't be able to see you. Um, so it says, sorry, it's taking me so long to get this to you. I just want to say a huge thank you for everything you and the CAMS Getting Help East team for the help you have given me. You are the first team of people to make my son and myself not feel like a tick box. The first time I called your team, I was desperate, as you know. The person that answered my first call spoke to me like a human being and reassured me that someone from the team would be in contact as soon as possible. I felt validated and that first call made such a difference. I wasn't on my own anymore. I wasn't going to have to fight to be listened to. My stress levels were lowering already. I was blown away a few days later with a phone call as promised from yourself. Once again, I was validated. Felt like my problems had been listened to. Your calm voice and how you explained you and your team would come up with a plan. From that phone call, I just knew that I could talk to you on a level. I didn't feel intimidated or interrogated as I have in the past. We have had many phone calls like that and many emails. I didn't feel alone anymore. There's trust. There's nothing worse than not knowing as a parent how to make things better for your child. I began to trust you and realised that you weren't going to fob me off with the usual spiel, things I've already tried or learned. This gave me hope. At some point, you brought up bringing X in for an assessment. There is no PC way of putting it for myself and X. That is hell on earth. Oh, my God, panic. He's never, ever gone along with anything like that. He fights for his life in situations like that, as I've explained to you in many a time. I took a few days to stew on it, and then I thought to myself, you can trust this woman. Give her a call and see if you can give her some direction as to how best to approach this assessment. So I did, and the Pokemon style assessment was created. You listened to me and let me take the lead in telling you what I needed from you in order for the assessment to be successful. You went the extra mile wearing your Pokemon shoes too. I won't go into everything we did together, but promise me you will shout about how it shout about it to your colleagues. It worked amazingly. I feel like you should be listening. Saved me so much anxiety and upset for both myself and X. You should be champion what you did. 
Can I also just say that your waiting room is one of the easiest we frequented. Having two rooms and the film playing really helps. The reception staff are smiling. The car park is a nightmare, but the receptionist put me at ease that I could park in the disabled zones and she would look out for anyone that needed the space more than X and I did. The first room that X and I saw you in was too small and hot. X got claustrophobic and we had to abandon the appointment. However, you were so calm with him and validated how he was feeling. He got a sly look at some Pokemon cards that you were holding on to, which you snuck to me and I gave to him later, from you obviously. I was able to say to X that he that you thought he deserved them. That planted a little seed in his head. And by that evening, he was talking about coming back to see you and trying again. He came back to see you. You made sure you had a much bigger room and the assessment was able to take place. The little bit of time and listening to me really, really paid off. This has also changed X's perception of going to see adults he doesn't know at all and being expected to bear his soul to them. This has been proven since when he had to visit the community dentist, then on to the parent led therapy. The way you delivered the information to me didn't blow me away and petrify me. You've never asked me to read the whole Fears and Worries book, although I have. You gave me just enough homework. I've never felt overwhelmed. Small steps, making X realise he can do things, therefore giving him confidence. Once again, you talked to me on my level. I felt I could open up to you about my life experience. You taught me the, that these experiences could have a bearing on X. The way you did it, though, you never once made me feel like a bad mother. You've actually made me feel pretty amazing about everything this journey has thrown my way. Anxiety breeds anxiety and encouragement and independence breeds confidence. Please make the powers that be listen. The way you work and your approach things should be how all professionals do. You've made such a positive difference and completely changed my perception on the professionals. I will actually miss our sessions, but you've made me realise that I can do this and I'm good at it. Thank you. And that concludes everything. Jade, could you just unshare your screen and then we can... Yeah, absolutely. There we go. Jade, that, 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 that's absolutely fantastic. Uh presentation and wonderful work so reassuring um I, I don't, well, I'll, I'll open it for questions I've got some but I'm, I must hold them back until my colleagues have had a chance to speak to you Alex <clears throat> Jane thank you wonderful to see the impact the team's having I've just got a, a particular question around schools and their expectations of the mental health support in schools and what's the feedback from schools to you and the team are there any gaps as far as they're concerned with where they get support do they understand the thresholds? Do they has there been any issues around managing expectations? Yeah, I think there was, um, I imagine there was a, quite a few teething problems in the beginning. So just for information, I've been in post since April last year, so coming up to a year. Um, and I think that generally our feedback is amazing from schools. They really appreciate the work that we do. Um, I mean, it doesn't cost them anything. So um, that's that's always <laughs> handy for a school. Um, but yes, our feedback gen generally is really, really good. Um, there's We have a lot of demand for the schools that aren't in the provision we get asked almost monthly when we're going to be taking on more schools when we're able to um, but because it's a government initi uh, initiative we are capped at the number on roll um, so unless a school drops out we can't really pick up another school until we're given um, another mental health support team um, they come in waves as they call them so when the next wave comes in if it's offered to East Berkshire then obviously um, we may be able to take on more schools but generally yes they, they're aware of our thresholds. Um, we talk over um, things in those school surgeries that I mentioned. So if they're kind of not sure whether it's for us or maybe whether it's the specialist cams, um, th that they can have that open conversation um, and they don't necessarily have to wait the six to eight weeks for the next one. They can contact um, their sort of the EMPs. Um, so we have EMPs assigned kind of designated to the school. So they have a designated person that they can reach out to. Um, 
I think sometimes there can be a little bit of a gap. Um, and I think you're, I mean, everyone's probably aware that there is a slight gap between our service and specialist CAMs, um, that sometimes they're a little bit too high for, for our threshold, but they're not high enough for specialists. Um, that's where um, our sort of my band seven senior clinicians sort of come into play, um, that if we can maybe, if they're maybe a little bit too high um, for my band five clinicians, then they may be able to be seen by a band sort of six or seven. Um, so there is a slight gap, I would say, but that's a that's a CAMS thing rather than um, anything to do with the schools. So, so just 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 a quick question, Martin, on, on the behaviour aspects that schools are often challenged with, that may that may not meet the threshold for your team. It, not not CAMS specialist work, but below that, or it may be excluded. And do you, do you see any issues or frustrations in schools around where they can get support for behaviour? Yeah, so um, behaviour, we don't necessarily see it unless there's a mental health presentation. So in the work that we do, there has to be some form of mental health um, need. Um, what we do find, though, is that one of our parental interventions called Incredible Years um, is a good intervention for um, behaviour, putting those structures and those boundaries in place in order for um, sort of parents to be able to manage. Um, so if they have a mental health presentation, but also behavioural difficulties, we can and do that but that's where our training and our workshops also can help that if maybe they don't meet um, that mental health need but have behaviour issues we may be able to do some work with the school in helping that so um, I know that one of the pet care modules is around behaviour we've also created our own resources um, and training and workshops around that coffee mornings um, for the parents quite often the schools ask the parents for a theme um, so it could be around anxiety it can be around behaviour. So although we may not be able to offer an intervention, there's there's other things around that whole school approach that we can do instead of. Thanks, Jade. Thank Very you. good. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, Sally, then Julian. A very interesting presentation, Jade. Can I, can I ask you, have you looked at your referrals from an ethnicity point of view? Do, do, do the referrals reflect the ethnicity of the no, and I was going to ask you whether you ever have this sort of um, the cultural sensitivity around different parenting styles. Whether you know that gets sort of factored in. Yeah, absolutely, Sally. This is a big piece of work that we're currently um, going through. So just for context, um, Slough's demogra main demographic is Pakistani. Um, and I think they I think from um, the CAMS away day last week um, or maybe a week on the 28th, um, I think it was 48.32, I want to say, percent um, was Asian population and um, majority of our referrals um, are white British. Um, so there is definitely um, a need there. So there's a couple of different projects um, that I've tasked my Getting Help team um, on and there's also a QI project going on. Um, someone's Yellow Bell um, has decided to take on a huge task um, of looking at the lack of diversity um, and this is Slough as a whole so this is not just my service, this is, is, this is all services in Slough um, and also through the Early Help Hub where we get our community referrals from. So there are pieces of work being done um, a couple of things my team have done is they've taken the top three languages spoken in Slough, which is Punjabi, Urdu and Polish, and have translated some leaflets, um, school leaflets. Um, we're just waiting on whether we've got the budget to um, to expand that into secondary schools. Um, so there's a couple of things that we're doing already. My Getting Help team, I have tasked them with almost like an awareness project um, where they're going around to all GPs, all non-MHST schools, places of worship, mental health charities, mental health organisations, and basically just screaming about our service. Now, a lot of people do know about us, but it's just that refresher. Um, and we're hoping, especially the places of worship, we're hoping that maybe um, we might get some more referrals. There's a couple of... Um, ideas within the early help hub um, or the local authority of maybe getting sort of a designated kind of community based person who we would work alongside with. Yeah. Um, but obviously I'm, I'm waiting to see whether they actually do materialise um, that role. So it's it's a big piece of work and we are already sort of working, working on it. Yeah, thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you, thank Sally. You, Sally. 
Julian. Yeah, good morning, Jay. Thank you for uh, that, that presentation. Um, it, it might feel like a tricky question, but it's not meant to be. Um, in the Thrive model, it's predicated obviously on sufficient support. And obviously the idea is, is you get as much early on as possible. Now, yeah. if you think about our child and adolescent mental health services, we often come in for sort of criticism because of the length of waits, which is understandable because sometimes we've got long waits. And that would come from schools and GPs, referrers, politicians and everything else. In your view, now seeing the landscape, do you think do you think there's anything more schools can do other than having a specialist service provided by you, which they don't financially contribute? Because we often interface with education professionals, and it would just be helpful just to think about is there something that schools could do that they're not doing that would be really helpful for our young people? Yeah, there's a couple of things. Um, education psychologists in Slough seem to be second to none. Um, a lot of schools have to sort of privately pay for um, an EP. Um, so I think that that's really, really lacking. Um, and we've seen the difference. Um, so just for context, my sister is an education psychologist in Surrey. And the, the difference of what, you know, the support that they can offer is very, very different to what Slough, I guess, is lacking from not having. I think there's only a couple. Um, and when I've asked their names to make contact, no one ever seems to know what their names are or what their contact details are so there's some unicorn EPs flying around Slough but no one seems to know who they are so I think education psychologists definitely need more of those in Slough um, because not all schools can can afford to pay for private um, private EPs and I think also not not all schools have almost like a dedicated mental health person. So we, um, our EMPs tend to liaise with sometimes the um, assistant head teacher or deputy head teacher. They might liaise with the head of schools. They might li liaise with a SENCO or a safeguarding lead, but only a handful of schools actually have a dedicated mental health lead. Um, and I think that as mental health, the awareness has been growing over the last five, ten years, maybe a little bit more, that actually having a dedicated mental health lead almost I think should be mandatory. Now, I'm a counsellor by background and I worked in a secondary school for three and a half years as a counsellor. Um, and my direct manager was the Senko that knew nothing about counselling. So I was having to to guide her and to sort of educate her. Um, and that school didn't have a dedicated mental health lead. They had safeguarding people, of course, but none of them were actually they were trained in safeguarding issues rather than mental health issues so I think those are two main things that I would say are lacking within schools now that's not all schools there are some schools that have so much support they have internal therapists as well as utilizing our service um, but if we're sort of thinking it quite general I would say EPs and mental health leads. Thank you very much um, I, I... I think I'm doing a visit to, to your service sometime in the near future. At least I hope I, oh, hope yes. I am. I hope I am. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's lucky for you, isn't it? Um, um, uh, but just just one question, then we must move on, Jay. But um, this is you're talking about Slough and East Berkshire. I'm not sure whether I should ask you or, or Tamina or Julian. But is this also across West Berks? Is there an equivalent service across West Berks? So it's a common yes. service across Berkshire. It's not not just funded yeah. in the east. So, because of the way that the West and the East are funded, um, the West only have an MHST in Reading. Um, they don't have the funding elsewhere within West. Um, I believe Wokingham have a equivalent service, which is an acronym I can never remember, and it's like PM or why something um i'd have to come back to you martin on the actual like, no, no, um, acronym, um because I, i'm not as familiar with the west as i am the east um so reading have an mhst um which i believe amanda mavunga um heads up and then we've got the wokingham kind of equivalent um of getting help um but apart from that no um i think that will just be due to bob funding i imagine um because it okay. is a government initiative okay that's fine. Anyway, thank you for that. Look, this is a fantastic presentation and uh, I can I can just I really see how the parents and the children benefit from this service. So fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. Please pass on our thanks to your, your team too, will you? Will um, do. Okay. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for letting me gate crash. <laughs> That's all right. No, it's fine. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much indeed. Thank we you. must move on, I'm afraid, but thank you. Take care. Bye bye.
Well, it's a fantastic presentation. Thank you, Debbie, for bringing that to the board. Um, clearly some issues about funding generally, about the, the, the breadth of the service, but um, not for now. OK, um, we must move on. 6.1 is Patient Experience Quarterly Report. We've got the papers, Debbie, so I think perhaps you can just pick out the key things you want to bring to our attention. Um, yeah, there's just three things that I wanted to flag, really. Thanks, Martin. I mean, the report is pretty similar to previous, some small fluctuations, but nothing if we looked at statistically over time would really, really show anything. The three things I just wanted to flag is I did mention from the quarter two report when I presented it that we had seen quite a decrease in patients feeling listened to in East Mental Health Services, although we were not able to triangulate that with anything it didn't correspond with um, any narrative feedback or increased complaints or any other um, informal concerns. And that has gone back up to much more positive levels this quarter, um, which we've kept an eye on. So I will continue to keep an eye on it, but it looks like for whatever reason that was, it has um, reverted to, to its previous positivity, which was good to see. We are doing a rapid improvement event with the support of the quality improvement team to see how we might improve our I Want Great Care take up. Um, and that is happening in April because despite having um, an increase we would need in order to get to our um, our 10 percent um, target from our strat from a strategy perspective. So um, that's the 16th of April, I think. Um, and 15 steps is on hold at the moment because it's being revamped. It will be recommencing um, from April. So you will start to see that reporting again, but it's um, moving over to the patient experience team. We're having a look and a refresh and then we will be um, taking that forward again. That was really the three things I wanted to flag. Thanks so much, Debbie. Any questions, Debbie? No, it's all very clear. We look forward to hearing more about it in, in a normal routine reporting. Freedom to speak up, self-reflection tool, Debbie. I think this is sort of just for approval, isn't it? Because we've uh... it is. It's um. It came to the discursive. It's been Mark has seen it, um, and others have seen it. So it is really here. Um, normally this would be two yearly. We took a dis we we did this last year, last July, but it is a newer tool and. Um, following the letter around the Lucy Letby case, we um, decided we would refresh sooner than the two years. So that, that is what we've done. We've got some actions in towards the back for sort of six to six months to two years. And I will bring updates on those actions six monthly to to formal board so it can be logged to the actions and progress we're taking. Thanks so much, Naomi. Yeah, I just wanted to inquire about how you rate the tool. Um, it wasn't it wasn't the easiest tool to use, and it was quite lengthy. Um, is what I would say. It's a, it's quite a different format. Mark's smiling because he liked to look at it with me. Um, <laughs> um, it's a different format to the other one, but the substance isn't actually much different when we pull it out. So it could probably be more succinct is what I would say if I was to write it myself, Naomi. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and I mean, I think most of us would agree with that. I, it, I think the, uh, the its purpose would be to, you know, to to move the dial, wouldn't it? To to and en and en enable yeah. some kind of form of continuous yeah. improvement. Yeah. And you yeah. feel that it has the it has the has what it takes to do that. I, 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 slow burn, I'm sure, yeah. you know. I think so. I think two things. I mean, if you look at our staff results compared to many, our focus actually needs to be on targeting those areas within the staff survey. They are not feeling so safe to speak up. We are pretty near to the best in terms of the four questions that are asked um, that are free to speak up. So you are trying to make relatively small changes target with targeted effort. Yeah. So I would say we are in a different place maybe to someone who is scoring below the average um, and has got some, some blanket, if you like, um, improvement work to do that would make a difference across the whole organisation. Um, yeah. The 
the actions we've come up with um, will absolutely be coupled. I couldn't put it in here at the time because obviously the results were embargoed, but we will be. One of the actions we've got is looking at those those specific services and teams that are not scoring so well, not feeling so confident to speak up or that we will actually address their concerns and look at what we can do within those teams. So for us, I would say it's more targeted, Naomi. Yeah, that makes complete sense, Debbie, because I, I note that the tool endeavours to encourage best practice to be shared. But mm. what you've just described, which is kind of uh, uh, incisive, you know, very targeted intervention, mm. but it doesn't feel like the tool is kind of addressing that at all. So, because where I was headed with this was, is there any opportunity to give feedback on the tool that might be helpful? And I'm not advocating you go, you, you create not contributing to get that. And if the answer is absolutely not, then it's absolutely not. You know, just just go with the flow type thing. Yeah. So what we are doing is 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 Mike is the regional chair for Freem Speak Up, so he does share a lot of what we do, and in turn get some ideas from others. And we also have recently. Um, I would say it's a stuttering start to get off the ground, but the Frimley ICB are really keen um, to work. We There are organisations that haven't even started using this tool yet, and this is our third iteration of it. Um, uh, there are also services that have got relatively new Freem Speak Up Guardians or um, more improvement to do, and I'm sure it is more beneficial for them. OK, thank you for that, Debs. Cheers. Thank you, Naomi. Sally? Well, I'm pleased um, ne Naomi made the point. I was going to say it seems a bit repetitive, this tool, but perhaps it's just me. Um, Debbie, I wonder if you could say a little bit about what good would look like in terms of de detriment. And, and because um, when Mike last came to the board, it seemed that he there was a great focus on detriment and he spent a bit of time talking about it, didn't he? And when I looked at our school, you know, we scored ourselves about three on that. But in terms of, you know, where we are now and then what good would uh, what good would look like in ar around that issue? Well, firstly, I think there's an under there's a it's about understanding what detriment is when somebody is. And that that's relevant to the teams and the services where the individual is, as well as to the wider organisation. Um, and then there's definitely something about us looking at um, actions that are taken when someone does raise concerns. So at the moment, um, some staff would say if they remain in, in a team, that's really tricky for them or um, if they are asked to move and it's somewhere they don't want to work that's also tricky for them so it, it's around what does it what does it look like for individuals I think Sally um, and making sure we're doing everything we can and making sure that the investigations are as quick and as smooth as they can be as well because obviously when things take longer then people are left hanging and, and they often feel a sense of, of increased detriment because of that. Now that's really helpful, Debbie, because it seemed to me this concept of detriment had really come into the focus over the last year or so, and I, it was helpful for me to have that sort of clarification. So thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Mark? <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Martin. I just wanted to um, go back to Naomi's question in terms of the usefulness of that, because we've obviously come out with a fairly positive um, response from the self-assessment and I know I mentioned at our discursive meeting that I did go back to Mike when I first saw those results to say is this truly realistic or are, do we have a halo effect in terms of ourselves as the organisation um, but I feel very reassured by those conversations with Mike his role as uh, Debbie's already mentioned regionally and Anecdotally, I attended a Guardian's uh, training session, NED session last week with around three dozen NEDs drawn from other trusts in the UK. And the tone coming through from those other NED representatives was far more in terms of how do we get more of our execs to engage with this? How do we increase transparency? How do we increase openness? Which isn't the kind of discussion we ever find ourselves having to take within our own trust and so I do feel it's a good reflection and an honest reflection on ourselves. 
Thank you very much, Mark. Well, Debbie, some, I think some interesting stuff and and um, uh, bureau bureaucracies often produce more and more paperwork when they have a problem thinking it's going to solve the problem. I think it's a cultural one. And I think because of trust, we're taking the right line. And I very much support, I think you see our colleagues do about focusing on those areas where we know there's more to do uh, rather than blanket everything. You know, we've got a target now for this trust. So thank you very much for that. Well, that's a good discussion. Thank you. It's a really important topic, of course. OK, um, I think now if I'm going to hand over a to Sally and, and Minu and just take us through item 6.3. Right. Th thank you, Martin. And I'll be brief. Um, you can see from the minutes we had a presentation on reducing restrictive um, practices, which is clearly a, there's a national focus on, on, on that. Um, and it was from the team at, at Prospect Park, and they've certainly done some very good work around there. We've had a threshold of uh, 15%, and actually since uh, August uh, 23, we've been below that threshold. So that now there's a particular focus on long-term seclusions and, and physical rest restraints. And, um, and, that, and I think one of the important things actually well, for me around that presentation is it's very much uh, data-driven. I won't say too much about the quality concerns because we'll talk about that in the in committee session. But you can see there that perinatal health has come on to the quality concerns register, and that's around the, the, the sort of mismatch between staff vacancies and, and high demand, and also in early intervention in psychosis. And I'm sure Tamina might want to say something about this in the in committee, but that's really as a result of benchmarking ourselves against the national audit, and there's a feeling that it's a by a bit of a fragmented uh, um, service and there were problems with low staffing. So that's going to be brought into the one team approach. Um, Campion has come off, but it's clearly because of the nature of the sort of closed environment and the high vulnerability of the patients with learning disabilities, it's always in a sort of line of, line of sight. The, the other presentation or the other um, item that I, I should bring to the board's attention was the um, discussion on the sexual safety of NHS staff and, 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 and patients. And when we get to the staff survey, we can see for the first time that there are two questions in there around uh, staff's perception of, of, of sexual safety. And uh, NHSE um, issued in June a, a, a charter which uh, with the, the trust is beginning to um, benchmark itself again and, and doing some work around on that. And because of the, the concerns around this and, and, and the national focus on it, we're going to have an, an update on the, uh, at the next committee. Um, the serious incident quarterly report, you can see there that from the beginning of January, we transitioned to the new, new framework. So there's going to be a, a more, and, and perhaps in, uh, Debbie might want to say a bit more about this, or we know we want to say that, but because of that and the issues around the data, Datex has been implementation issues around that quite challenging implementation issues in ter terms of staff navigating around the Datex system that we're, we're beginning to see perhaps more, more, more small small incidents or less serious incidents reported. But there, there's a focus on quality improvement and, and supporting families. I won't say anything around um, uh, the, 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 the mortality review or um, the, the, um, the, the safe staffing report, because I think um, um, uh, Minu might want to say something ar 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 around that. But um, other than that, I'm quite happy to take um, questions on the minutes. Any, any questions, comments for Sally? No, very clear, Sally, thank you. So I'm going to hand over to Minu. Thank you. Thanks, Sally, for the summary. Um, and and uh, regarding the uh, learning from deaths report, it's a fairly standard report. Um, no deaths which are uh, cause for concern from a governance point of view. Uh, this format of the report is probably the last one where we have the sort of a broader mortality process reported separately and the SI is reported separately because from January we now have a combined system under PISA whereby we review 
all debts under the same uh, process. Um, so, so, so the next quarter report uh, would probably look slightly different and, and try to bring everything together and, and more data and charts there, which are representative. Um, so happy to take any questions on the learning from debts report uh, from the board. Any questions? No, it's very clear. Thanks, Minim. Thank you. Uh, regarding the Guardian report, um, uh, we can see that there has been um, what we would see as an unusual increase in number of um, um, reported um, uh, uh, extra time that the juniors have spent working beyond their designated shifts. And we've explored that further. Um, there are a number of factors uh, we need to consider, one of which is, of course, um, uh, the, the, the juniors um, uh, feeling generally under pressure broadly about work um, and, and of course, the impact of industrial action, the 10th round, which is just completed. Uh, but when we explore the individual areas, there's a mix of one particular ward where the juniors stayed over 10, 15, 20 minutes extra to complete some patient work which they were involved in, uh, but preferred not to hand over to the next junior who was coming on. Um, but in a sense, because uh, reporting uh, uh, under the Guardian uh, reporting mechanisms is a neutral act, they sort of uh, agreed that they should report it. So we don't see this as the working pattern of juniors having changed or anything, but um, with the juniors being more willing to report uh, any additional time that they spend, even time traveling back from uh, their education session in Oxford. Uh, which is almost certainly going to breach the time because the education session covers the full uh, allocated shift. Uh, so, so, so those are the various factors. We've discussed um, these with the juniors. Uh, they're going to be carrying on with um, more prompt reporting and discussion with their consultants and supervisors. Thank you very much. Any comments? No, in which case, thank you, Minu. Thank you, Sally. That's. Uh... Very clear. Um, executive report. Uh, I think Julian, we just have questions for Julian. Any questions? Item seven. No. Okay, in which case, let's get on to something I'm sure we all want to hear about the staff survey revol results. So we've got uh, Jane and Steph Works with us. A big thank you to Steph for putting together the report. The uh, staff survey results of 2023 were published last Thursday. Came off embargo. Really pleasing to see another strong set of results for us, and particularly supported by an increase in uh, response rate, in increasing the validity uh, comfort we can take. This is a, a really representative, rude view of uh, perspectives by our staff. Um, we can benchmark against others, but I think there are some facts here I just want to highlight in terms of um, top of our class in terms of staff engagement for the fourth year running. Um, staff seeing this is a great place to work, again, talk about the sector, uh, and for the first time in a few years now, the organisation reporting that it sees um, care of our patients as a top priority. And I think those two areas are directly linked to our ambition around the vision to be a great place to get care, a great place to give care, so very encouraging. And I, I point towards the vision rather than benchmarking against others, so that's where we need to be. Thinking about. Obviously, within those top results, there's a, a number of staff that don't feel um, that view. We can see the report that Jane will take us through. Uh, there are areas of focus that relate for us from different perspectives. Of course. So I will stop there and ask Jane just to take us through a bit of context and detail. Okay. Thank, thank you very you. much. Welcome, Jane. Thank you. And I think Steph is going to show the slides. And for those of you who don't know Steph, um, uh, Steph um, um, is our um, engagement lead in the trust and um, looks after um, all of the collation of the staff survey results for us. And she has prepared in you know, the presentation today. Um, so any sort of detailed questions, Steph's always able to answer all the detail for you. <laughs> Just to pop you into some uh, context of this, um, um, on the national call last week, um, uh, it was 
uh, became clear that we have got a data quality issue on a couple of questions. For us, it's a minor data quality issue, but it does mean that some of our data um, is being um, held back until they can finalise the actual results. It affects only a tiny number of, of, of people in our survey, and it relates specifically to one set of questions. Question 13, would you, you know, you couldn't make up a better number to be affected, could you? Question 13, which are the questions around uh, physical violence? So overall, we still think we've got a pretty a robust set of, um, of of scores for everything else, and there's a slight um, you know question on um, uh, question 13. So we just put an asterisk by that. Again, to put this into context in terms of the national picture, so um, the national team seemed really pleased with the um, staff survey results last year. Uh, to put again this into context, um, in 2022, so not last year, but the year before. They had the um, nationally, um, the NHS suffered some of its worst scores that it's ever seen in five years. Um, and this year, the scores are much better. Um, so they're much, um, you know, they're improving again. So they're uh, very pleased to see that that um, dip is is reversing nationally. Um, the um, and IC level, uh, ICS level, again, very pleased. Um, most of our my colleagues seem to be very pleased. Their results are going up. The exception seems to be in the ICBs, which, as you may expect, are going to are going through a diff difficult time at the moment with restructuring. So not unexpected that they did see dips in their scores. Um, but that's just to set some context before we go um, into into our slides. So, yeah, if we could go to the first slide then, please. Um, which where we talk about response rate. Um, really excited to get, you know, a 67% response rate. Um, you know, a lot of people taking the time to say what it's like to work here and well above average and, you know, continuing a trend that we're seeing of, of more people responding. You know, a, a really big thanks to operational colleagues, I think, who've done a lot to try and encourage people and to complete the survey and, and created time for people to complete the survey. If we go to the next um, next slide, please. Our overall engagement score is 7.45. So, um, yeah, we're, we're sort of you know slightly up, and it will round up this year to 7.5. Um, so definitely, um, you know, looking at um, you know best in class scores um, for us again, um, which we're really pleased to see. Um, as I say, against the national average, it's increasing as well. So good to see that we're following that trend. If we go to the next one. Um, this again talks about how our engagement score is calculated. I will also remind people that as soon as you start moving into engagement scores, which are around 7.5, you know, that's a world class score for engagement. It's really quite hard for organisations to get much above, you know, 7.5 score. So, you know, we've done really well. Um, you know, uh, when you take into account all of those factors that um, will create that overall engagement score, there's a lot of people having to say quite a lot of really good things about the organisation. So, you know, our, the self-motivation, the advocacy and involvement is is really um, good. Um, and I know Debbie will want me to say this. We'll talk about it as well later on. But we are top of class in terms of recommending the organisation as a place to work. Which is good to know. So if we go to the next um, next slide, our staff survey results, we always compare against the people promise. Um, that's um, the uh, NHS people promise. Um, that's in line with how national um, like to present the schools. And again, it, it gives a, a nice way of showing some of the themes of what we um, are dealing with um, on a day to day basis. So if we look at all of our, our different themes here, um, again, we're um, sh uh, uh, top of class, as I say, for staff engagement and um, a number of our schools are statistically improved. Uh, we've got statistically significant improvements in the scores. I won't take you through all the detail. If, um, I'm sure you can ask questions at the end. Next one, please. And then um, top scoring questions. Um, Again, uh, we've got a couple of the questions there um, just to show you what our top scores are. And actually, um, uh, we've actually got some of the top scores in, in, in class as well. So recommending the organisation as a place to work, as we said, and the team feeling it has a set of shared objectives. Um, and that's shared objectives, I'm sure, is coming back from the plan on a page approach where we cascade all of our um, 
our objectives through the organization. Um, good to see um, a really um, big increase in work-life balance because we've done quite a bit of work trying to focus on work for, on work-life balance, particularly because we know one of the main reasons that people leave the organisation is often because their inability to uh, balance um, home and work-life. I hope that that actually, the, the, one of the things that we've done differently this year is we do have it a um, email address now so if people want flexible working and they um, want some support in trying to help um, organize that there is a central email and our people partners uh, will work with line managers and staff to try and make um, flexible working arrangements for them either within their service or in another service if it can't be done at their local level can we go to the next one please we had a huge amount of significant improvements um, this year. Again, I'm not going to go through each and every one of them, but um, 28 of our questions showed a statistically significant improvement compared to last year. And in the year before, we only had three. So again, what we're seeing here is a much more positive response um, from the organization and again you know it's mirroring what's going on um, nationally um, but you know 28 significantly um, you know uh, increased scores is really important to see so uh, you know we're pleased with that if we can go to the next one I'm again won't go through every single one of those um, but you know, it gives you a feel for where we're moving in the right direction with a number of things, and particularly some of the ones which um, you know worry us, such as um, you know people coming to work when they don't feel well enough, um, you know having resources to do the job properly, that type of thing. Okay, if we move to the next one. We did have some declines. Um, sadly, you know, in, in, in generally a sea of good information, there are a couple of things that we've got to look at. Time um, always passes quickly when I'm working has gone down. It's a strange question. I'm, I'm never quite convinced that we really know what we get from that question, but you know, just to be aware of that. Um, strong attachment to the team has gone down slightly, and that's that's an interesting one because we do know that team support continues to be a driver of high engagement. And the more that people feel supported by a team, part of a team, strongly attached to a team, that that will drive high engagement. So that is something that uh, we need to keep an eye on and we need to, to, to work on in, in that space. And then the, again, one that we, um, we, we, I know we're going, you know, Debbie and I have been you know, talking about as part of the um, safety culture work is that um, uh, people feel confident that we would address concerns about unsafe clinical practice. I don't know whether that is a reflection of what happened with the Lucy Let's Be or whether that is something, you know, deeper within um, our own organisation. But again, that's something we need to really take seriously this year. If we go to the next slide. So these are our, our workforce race equality standard slides. So they show where we are. Um, we are seeing you know, more positive trends, still not where we want to be, um, but we are seeing improvements for our ethnically diverse colleagues across all indicators and our scores remain better than average. I think the phrase is, you know, are we measuring the mediocre against, you know, the even more mediocre sometimes, um, but it, 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 the the work that we're doing around um, anti-racism is really um, to look at, uh, at tackling some of these under these um, areas here and the underlying issues um, here. Um, so that's the um, it, that still remains a critically important piece of work if we're going to be able to shift any of these schools significantly over time for our um, ethnically diverse colleagues. Because yeah, there are you know, results here that whilst they're improving are still nowhere near where we would want them to be. If we go to the next one, and um, this is the same on the workforce disability equality standard, again, national um, standard that we report against. Again, we're seeing some you know, mainly positive trends, one um, that has declined, one that's not really changed, still scoring better than average in seven of the nine. Um, but you know, as with ethnicity, inequalities do remain. Um, and again, um, it means that we continue to have to you know, focus in this area. Um, so yeah, there's some 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 things that we've got to um, continue to look at in in here. So if we go to um, 
The next one, sexual orientation. Um, so the report indicates that colleagues who identify as gay, lesbian or bisexual um, have a poorer experience compared to those who are heterosexual or straight. Again, not acceptable, not something we want to see, that differentiation. Um, so again, has to um, you know, we keep looking at this, keep mon you know, keep monitoring on this, keep reminding this you know, the organisation of our support, um, you know, uh, still you know, the investment that we um, put behind our Pride Network, for example. So we move to the next one. And for the first time, we've actually reported on sexual safety. Um, uh, this year. As some of you might be aware that there's been an article um, came out this morning um, in one of our, our, our local newspapers um, reporting on the results of sexual safety, um, having seen the staff survey. Uh, we remain, um, you know, we. W this is the first time we've had this sort of report. Um, Sexual safety is a real area of focus for the NHS at the moment. As you know, we're working on our uh, sexual safety charter. Um, yeah, we want a zero tolerance approach to any inappropriate or um, you know harmful sexual behaviours. We aren't at best of class in this area. Um, we are below average, but we're not at best of class. But even best of class is still not appropriate. Um, so yeah, again, uh, sexual safety. Uh, is is an, an area we're going we we we're starting to put a lot more focus around. Um, as you can see, there is uh, we measure both from patients and from staff and colleagues. Um, but every incident uh, from a colleague is um, you know we we need to investigate. Patient service users, some of that you know may be related to capacity, may not be um, patients with capacity. But again. Um, it's understanding, you know, the, what's happening and following through with actions um, when we're made aware of that. If we go to the next one. So our focus areas, because we've talked a lot about you know, focus areas, um, continuing with the anti-racism work stream, um, this is going to be really important. This is where we've really got to significantly make um, some inroads into the structural inequalities that we have um, within the organisation. The big conversations that have just ended and um, the, the ideas that will come out of that, um, I think will help us to ensure that we focus on things that are going to make the biggest difference for staff. And we've got a meeting um, this afternoon afternoon where we will start talking about you know what's coming out of those conversations and where we want to um, take that work forward. The violence prevention and reduction work has re um, really um, uh, start is starting you know to really um, uh, have a level of focus in the organisation um, with follow through from um, uh, inappropriate behaviours from patients, um, violence you know, from patients with capacity and anecdotally you know we were talking the other day with uh, prospect park and they are beginning to see um actions um taking place so it's about following through and continuing with that work and as i say the sexual safety charter work stream is now up and running to really focus on sexual safety when we did a deep dive um, just as an example in our area um in, in the people directorate, when we looked at sexual safety, um, most of the issues um, in our directorate, I cannot talk about others, seem to be about inappropriate comments rather than actual physical, um, uh, uh, in, you know, anything physical. But that still does not mean that that's acceptable and should be tolerated. So we've got to um, you know, really work on that. And then we recognise really with such high scores that actually we need to um, really focus in on those areas where uh, we're getting reports of poorer staff experience. So working with divisions to target those teams, those service areas that need the most support and help to try and um, uh, increase staff engagement. So um, discussions starting to take place with support from people partners with divisional management teams, uh, looking at their results and discussing you know, where they really want to focus their efforts, discussing you know, the next steps and creating the action plans for them. I think one more slide wasn't there. Um, and that's so next steps in terms of what's happening. Um, the results have been shared from Julian. Um, there's an all staff briefing on the 21st of March. Um, we share the information with our staff, staff networks and our unions, and we will be supporting them with next steps and actions where um, 
We will also um, be taking uh, this presentation out to trust leaders and managers for a discussion at Trust Leaders and Managers Forum. And you know, thank you to Steph, who's going to be presenting that because I'm away on leave. And the most important important action really is for leaders and managers to review results with their teams and to look at what actions they can take to improve experiences locally. Um, but top level results are all live on Nexus along with this presentation um, and there are other slides and prompts that we can use and um, to create for individual conversations within teams. I'll pause there and then leave it for questions. Thank you very much. Can you answer? Oh, that's right. Thank you. Well, obviously some very, very pleasing results and I know a lot of hard work's gone in across the trust to, to get there and also clarity about where we need to focus to uh, address some of those ones where we're not quite where we want to be. All right, any questions for colleagues? Comments? Mark? Yeah, um, first of all, it goes, almost goes without saying congratulations to all of the executive team. Um, I think it's very easy to almost to gloss over what a fantastic set of results this is because it continues a long trend. But well done, Julian, and all the executive and the leadership you have to be commended. Um, just picking up the piece, Jane, where you talked about focusing actions on the areas where the biggest difference can be made. I would certainly endorse that. But the thought crossed my mind. Could some thought be given to what we as non-executive members could do to support that, whether it's in terms of our board um, to the floor meetings, whether it's um, visits, um, 15 steps, whatever, if there are things that we could be do, doing to support that. Um, I think that we'd be keen rather than just simply be observed as to what is going on there to feel that we are part of it rather than just simply sitting on the sidelines with it. Yeah, thank you. And that's certainly an offer that we could take back um, because, as you say, um, even sometimes just getting some attention from some of the um, the, the non-exec directors might be helpful or just getting a, a, a different um, uh, um, individual into here what's happening can can make a big difference to some areas. But Steph, we can take that away as an offer for um, the divisions, can't we? Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Mark. Sally. Um, th thank you for that presentation, and I, I you know, I, I'll echo what Mark said. It's a, it's a very, very impressive set of um, outcomes. Can I just ask a couple of questions? Um, one is around the governance, around the action plans, because obviously you, you said that local areas are going to develop our action plans, and where you get the oversight of those action plans, and how it sort of comes back. And the second one is a sort of, um, it's more of a, a, a micro que question in terms of. The sexual safety results, when I looked at those, they were against sort of the, 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 the charts were nationally, you know, looking at us against uh, what was best and worst nationally. Does it make a difference if you look at mental health trusts? And I know Debbie's going to come in and say, actually, it can happen to yeah. all different areas. But my, my sense is that you get more incidents in within mental health trusts because the, the, some of the patients can be very ill at, at, at times and disinhibited does that make a difference or is that a figment of my imagination and debbie's about to tell me it's a figment of my imagination <laughs> <laughs> De debbie did you want to come in were you put your hand up to come yeah. in there <laughs> so um from a patient perspective that may well be true from a staff on staff perspective that isn't um, right. and some of some of the bigger national you know things that have hit national press um around staff on staff are actually acute trust rather than mental health trust so um so part in part possibly um some right. some validation to that but certainly not in total sally and actually it and actually when i've looked at our responses in detail around sexual safety it's not all the mental health it's not all the mental health services by any stretch that are reporting patient related sexual harassment, community nursing um, right. flagged and another uh, and a number of others. So people going into patients own homes. Um, so so I don't I, I think it would be wrong to assume that just because it, we're a mental health trust, we are going to see more. Now, that's really helpful for me you know, to contextualise those results. Mm. 
Um, Thank you. Yeah. Very much. On the, on the, right. Just to add to that, on the national call, there was some real concern about behaviours, particularly in theatres. Interesting. Yeah. OK, Naomi. Yeah, I'm just uh, interested to know. Uh, well, firstly, congratulations and well done. That goes without saying almost. But um, is this and maybe it's a question for Julian. Are these the results you expected? Yes. Yes, I mean, we, we shouldn't have any surprises. Um, obviously, you could point to individual scores, but as a, as a global sort of staff engagement recommended as a place to work. The success really isn't this year. It's the fact we're top for four years, five years. That starts to yeah. make, make the difference. It's consistency that is different. And actually, if you look at a decade, we've been in the, the top three or four for 10 years, which is extraordinary. And at the moment, to get a recommendation of a place to work, you'd have to travel a very long way. So the whole of the south of England, that's southwest, southeast, you couldn't even go to the Midlands to find somewhere. That is a very big geography that we're starting to cover. So very pleased around that. Um, the key issue is homing in, so to take Sally's question, on those areas where the experience is less so. So you covered off the sort of uh, areas uh, around rares and dares. Um, we probably less sort of micromanage the action plans on those teams. So through the appraisal process, particularly Tamina at Cascaded Down, we'll have an objective which will be outcome based, you know, the 10, 15, 20 teams that are struggling the most where we expect to see improvement, we'll just put an improvement trajectory on that. And then, you know, the plumbing and wiring teams can kind of look after it. It will be more about the outcomes really. Yeah. About where we're where where we're at. Um Thanks, because Julian. I think I... that's where, where we're going to get the biggest benefit. Yeah, that that uh, that backdrop around the trend, the long term trend is is so significant in terms of the, the context. The other question I had, and it really is a, a, a an open question. Do you think, well, could we and do you think it would be meaningful to get the results from our um, the trusts that comprise our ICBs? I just think these are so, you know, there's such a depth of insight that comes from these reports that is, a, I know it's a snapshot, but I don't know. What what do you think? Yes, and Jane Jane and her, her colleagues will do that. So we, we can sort of um, we'll bring that back uh, to, to the next board or the one after where you can just see. So against obviously what that is against the national uh, sort of benchmark, uh, those trusts that we are currently um uh, you know, working in system with we again we we will do that very easily. In fact, there's already some work done. Um, but obviously, we don't want to overload you with all, all of that information. The kind of national benchmark sure. is quite helpful. Yeah, yeah we, and, we, we and the, that's, do that. that's fine, Gillian. And I'm not uh, in the least bit advocating that you know th this would be a matter for you operationally if you had the data in front of you. So what? Uh, you know, not necessarily something for for the board to pay attention to unless you felt it was it was the right thing to do. Thank you. Thanks so much. Just before I go to Mina, I just feel that this uh, um, long term high level of performance is driven by a cultural issue rather than individual actions, as it were. So I think it's about the overall culture of the way the trust is run and the way it, uh, this openness and support for staff. So I, I think it's that rather than a specific, uh, that'd be my judgment, rather than a specific action here or a specific action there. Um, and, and whilst it's always interesting to see what others are doing, um, I, I always worry about losing focus on what we do and what more we need to do. But uh, that's my narrow minded view. <laughs> Tamina. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I was quite interested in this year's results because obviously we've had a really significant operational restructure. And I did wonder whether that would be affected adversely or positively in the results. Um, just to let the board know, I will be doing a more thorough evaluation of the of the changes. I think there's a lot of learning in any case, but I was interested to see whether it would play itself through with the staff survey results. I think from my perspective with my senior team, um, I think as we've discussed, it's not just looking at the difference in experience with protected characteristics, but also those overarching results will be hiding some really high performing teams in terms of the questions that are being asked in the survey, but other areas where we know there are some significant issues. So um, I would like to learn from the teams who are consistently doing well or have made a significant improvement like we observed last year with, with some of the children's teams. Um, but just need to think about some of that variation and what might be causing that. We have 
we have a little bit of, of information now developing around some of our smaller specialist teams. Sometimes they're a bit difficult to track through the staff survey because of the number of results. But there is something we start to triangulate around the staff survey, through them to speak up and some staff concerns being expressed around those very small teams and how we can make sure we're looking at the culture within those as well as some of the board teams as well. So it would be interesting to come back to the board just in terms of the reflections from my divisions about their about their learning and thoughts from the staff survey, maybe in a few months time when we start to develop the action plans. Very good. Well, thank you very much. Just to say thank you very much again, Jane, well to you and all the colleagues at the Trust. Uh, fantastic results and uh, I know we won't stop, so we'll keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Take care. No, thank Bye -bye. you very much indeed. Bye. Uh, well, that is really, really interesting and positive stuff. Um, we must move on, however, on to performance. Item 8, finance report, Paul. Thanks, Martin. Um, so I guess in, in context of a challenging national position and challenging financial position within uh, within our local systems, we continue to perform well financially and still look like we're on track to deliver um, ahead of our forecast for, for the financial year. So the numbers for January, our year to date surplus moved to 2.1 million, which is 1.9 million better than planned. Um, further 700,000 surplus reported in the month. In terms of just some key elements around our income and funding, um, obviously I think we previously reported um, we've got additional 600,000 of income coming from NHSE in regard of uh, initial settlement around industrial action costs. Um, we've also agreed a position with Bob around elective recovery activity and associated funding which means we've recognised a further 1.2 million of income in the month. Um, there has been some additional funding issued nationally um, around deficit support and further industrial action funding. Um, but given uh, the position of providers within Bob, um, we're not going to take any of those allocations and they're going to be focused on the organisations that are in deficit or have incurred significant costs in relation to industrial action. So I don't see any of that coming into us or moving forecast before the end of the year. Um, in terms of areas of uh, risk that we previously reported, um, certainly in terms of our out of area placements, the numbers have come down over the past two months, which is really encouraging. So that kind of de-risks our forecast position. Um, we're averaging about 25 beds in January, which was down from the 40 that we were running at um, kind of October time. Um, probably 40% of those relate to peak capacity, which we know we struggle with. Um, and then we've obviously got the six beds that we've closed at PPH on our uh, kind of transition to moving to right sizing the wards. So um, taking those two into account, we've probably got about another 10 beds outside of that that we're um, that are out of area beds at the moment, which we're covering off. Um, probably worth noting just where we're at with our workforce numbers at the moment. You'll see that um, including temporary staffing, we, our numbers are broadly now at where we expected to be in terms of plan. So we're going to have to closely monitor those workforce numbers for the remainder of the year, especially heading into next financial year in terms of the assumptions we've made around run rates and starting establishments for next year. Um, increases in substantive numbers this month of about 56, but also we've seen temporary staffing still remain quite high. So we're doing a targeted piece of work around looking at where the hotspots are in terms of temporary staffing. I know certainly mental health inpatients is one area where we continue to see high usage um, as well as having a high number of vacancies as well. So piece of work to carry out there. Agency spend still within the headline numbers um, that we're expected to do. So about 3.2% opposed to the target of 3.7. In terms of forecast, um, we've revised the forecast to a 3.8 million surplus for the end of this year. Um, this is the 3.1 I think we discussed with the board previously, but we've also recognised some work that we're doing at the moment around um, asset valuations, which we expect to see a benefit from by the end of the year, and that's what's moving the forecast to 3.8 now. 
Uh, if I move on capital, um, we're 1.6 behind where we expect it to be, but um, expect to catch that up by the end of the year in terms of um, projects completing. And outside of our CDL numbers, um, the spend on PFIs related expenditure is going to be short by about 2.5 million this year. And that's entirely due to um, place of safety, which is now going to be delivered next year and decarbonisation at West Barks, which will be delivered now in 25-26. Um, cash still healthy and still ahead of plan, 55 million in the bank for now. Happy to take any questions. Well, thanks so much. Um, any questions, any comments? Well, it looks to me, Paul, that um, you and your colleagues are doing a great job in managing a difficult situation. and. Uh, uh, you know, I think we am going to sort of to be very insightful to realise that money is going to be very tight, irrespective of who's in government for the next few years. So, uh, I think we all in the NHS need to be looking at how we can deliver, you know, more or at least the same for less or more for the same. Um, and that's going to be quite tricky judgments, I think, on some of these things, particularly when we know we're already sort of reasonably. Um, well, pretty good really in terms of the way we deliver and we have a discussion don't we at our next discursive well then discursive after next about productivity which the nhs is very seized with and uh, just to to check that you know we, where we are on that quite complicated measure um uh, so we don't, don't get complacent okay well thank you for that um uh, I've got an outside, just a detailed question, one on the grass, but I'll do it outside the meeting, if I may. Paul, Paul, just, I, did, I, I did, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm here to help you. Um, let's move on to 8.1 then, performance report. Uh, thanks. If I just, I'll um, take the report as red, but uh, I'll just focus in on a couple of the uh, the key breakthrough metrics that are currently showing red at the moment. So, um, bed occupancy um, in terms of community beds ready for discharge. 888 against a target of 500 um, and those delays relating to 135 patients still seeing uh, packages of care has been the primary reason for delays in getting patients out. Um, certainly in this month, Jubilee Ward was one that was flagging with a significant number of delays and there's been some really good engagement with the um, DAS in that area around trying to move some of those uh, patients and packages on um, and I think the recent numbers show um, significant reduction so we are working well with uh, where we can with directors of social care and in terms of visibility we've now got our delays reporting on Frimley dashboard and we're doing a lot of work internally around reporting with a new bed management system or reporting system going live in April. Um, clinical ready for discharge on the mental health wards again um, higher than planned um, 371 against 250 target, but this is down from previous month where we were at 542. Um, average delays um, have come down from 18 days to 13, um, and the delays covered 28 patients. Longest delays are remain within Sorrel, where obviously the complexity of the patients is a significant barrier to um, discharge, and we've certainly got some exceptionally long stay patients in there where the work we're doing to try and get packages in pair uh, um, are falling through uh, repeatedly, which is a, a challenge for us. Um, and then final one just drawn is physical assaults on staff, which um, at 48 uh, remain slightly ahead of target. Um, still seeing high number of cases, obviously at uh, PPH with POS, Campion, Sorrel and Snowdop accounting for majority of the cases this month. And the team are still continuing to work with Thames Valley Police in terms of inviting them to status exchanges uh, to try and improve reporting. And we've put a new role into PPH to help support staff uh, post incidents as well. So I'm happy to leave it there and just take any questions on the report. Thank you very much. I think you've covered most of it, but Sally. And um, Paul, our, our, perhaps it's not for you, but for Alex, but our sickness rate um, remains sort of persistently high doesn't it at four point what I look at it at 4.8 against a target of 3.5 and I wondered if you know, perhaps it wouldn't be for you to comment on you know the the the, the, the sort of 
um, activity that's being taken place around trying to bring that down a bit. Yeah, so we, mean is we, we're doing a check back over our trend and a broad sense that we're not out of line with some seasonal sickness this time of year, but there is a, a new um, ops director led sickness work stream that we're going to get into to check out around our processes for management, but also uh, specifically around anxiety, depression and mental health related stress, which is a significant portion of our sickness absence. Uh, having got everything in line and all of our resources aligned to that adequately. So I think those are two key focus areas for us. Uh, and uh, Alex, is it around particular areas? You know, there's some areas where you get much more sickness and whether they triangulate with other things. Like, we are trying you know, I haven't got that at my fingertips in terms of specifics and to me and those. Um, I'll, I'll come in. Yeah, th th thank you. So I think it's a number of things around because it's a it, because it's a percentage. Actually, if you have a small team, if one person's off sick for a significant period of time, that does massively throw off kilter what the overall percentage is. Um, we've had a rapid improvement event, which was really well attended to look at some of the drivers around sickness, but also specifically some of the countermeasures we could take to try and improve the management and the way in which we support staff who are sick. Um, and that's one of three pieces of work. I'm really pleased that HR are working so positively with ops on um, sickness. There's um, some work on caseload and there'll be work on recruitment as well. So a really important piece of work, rapid improvement event, where we brought a lot of data together to truly understand and unpick where some of the issues or challenges were, but also looking at some of those areas where they seem to be managing sickness well. So there is a significant amount of triangulation going on also about whether there are issues with particular demand and capacity issues the pressure and the type of work that staff are undertaking as well does seem to have a um, an impact as well so it's it's probably worth I'd be really happy to kind of bring some of that work back so i uh, think claire williams i think is the ops lead for this particular bit of work working closely with um hr so it might be that we can come back and share some of the early findings and actions we might want to be taking um to the board at some point or maybe one of the one of the committees if that's more appropriate thank you that's very helpful Thank you, Sally. Tamila, did you have something else to say? Or No, no, I was just going to comment okay. on that. That's all right. Thanks so much. Any other comments, questions? OK, well, just, um, on, just on that, Martin, I mean, I think that's, yeah. that was a help, helpful update. Obviously, it is, there's a I mean, you can look at the graph. It, 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 there is a seasonality to it. So, you know, six months ago, it was a percent lower, which no surprise in the summer. Um, the best we've ever managed as an organisation, whether you know, pre-COVID posting, is just around the four percent for the year uh, and the three and a half percent, I think is a, a helpful stretch target to see if those specific interventions can sort of make a difference. For trusts like ours, we're sort of about average, just below average in terms of our sickness rate at the moment, uh, about where it's at to give it sort of a, a sense. But obviously the three and a half percent is because we don't want to be average. We want to you know, um, build on the staff engagement and everything else whilst at the same time of course there's been this horrible cold going around we don't want people coming to work you know with horrible no. colds and everything else uh, and back in the day 15 years ago 10 years ago that was commonplace people would come with really uh, stinking colds to work and we've been much clearer post-covid that those people are to stay away and not not come to work which i think is a good thing overall um so yeah, something to, to look at to see whether actually there was interventions in maybe the the stress, anxiety, sort of burnout stuff. We can make some some inroads there and see that reduced. And again, perhaps have a look at our um, the impact of our MSK uh, intervention as well, which again is a is a reasonable contributor. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that, then, Paul. Um, Naomi, Finance Investment Performance Committee. Any comments you want to make? I can be <laughs> super brief, uh, Martin. The, the board's Thank you. Uh, very, very much uh, in the nose that we're in terms of our financial position. Um, I think the only thing I wanted to mention was that the committee had a brief conversation about productivity, actually. Uh, it was sort of framed in the context of the, uh, of the next financial plan, so the planning process for 24-25, but really recognising that uh, in the near and longer term, the need for us to thoroughly understand what productivity and efficiency really means. Uh, and, you know, a, as appropriate, the committee is keen to support the efforts of the board and the trust more generally to, to, you know, to thoroughly understand that going forward. 
and start pulling the levers as and when we can. So that was that piece. And as I say, it was in the context of the planning process for this coming financial year, which is only, what, three weeks away, I think, Paul. Um, and at that moment, back in January, the National Planning Guidance course was not readily available. And the board's aware of that. I don't, I don't know, Paul, is there an update? Are we, are we going to be able to see something in the next FIP, which I think is uh, 21st of March? Um, it, you will, yes. Um, and national planning guidance is apparently this week. It's going to oh, be right, issued now that now, now that we've got through the budget, we're expecting it this week. Well, well, that's great. So I look forward to seeing something in FIP. And again, um, you know, the 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 team has been priming the pump on developing our draft plan well ahead of the national planning guidance being delivered. So I've no doubt that we'll be in extremely good shape. And of course, it also sits within, uh, uh, the, the, again, the, the ICB context and our knowledge and understanding that our two ICBs are in significant deficit going into the new planning cycle. Any questions? No, I, just, just to reiterate, thank you, Naomi, just to reiterate that uh, uh, about productivity, I was at the NHS chairs event with the NHS England board and uh, um, the finance director of NHS England was very, very strong on this issue of productivity and the view that the Treasury has. I think that, um, you know, there's a lot more money gone into the NHS and the output is in the simplistic terms has not gone up proportionally. Of course, when you unpick some of this, it gets very, very complicated as to, uh, um, and anyone who's done any detailed benchmarking of other organisations knows it's not always very easy to know whether you're more efficient or less efficient. But nevertheless, it's clearly a, a major issue and we know that money is going to be constrained. So it does behove us to look in a, ourselves, um, I think, as Julian would say, take the wood out of our own eyes just to make sure that um, there isn't more we can do in these difficult circumstances. But um, thank you for that. OK. Um, I think we now do uh, Julie fit and proper person's test. I think we probably do quite quickly, Julie. But... Yeah, no, absolutely. Just to say that since writing the, the, the policy, NHS England's issued its nas the national leadership competency framework. So I'll just need to, to make references to that document in, in this, this policy. OK, thank you. Everyone content? We have to approve it. Thank you very much. And your health and safety report, Paul. Thanks, Martin. Uh, again, take it as right, just pull some of the highlights. Um, so over the past year, um, no enforcement notices from health and safety executive or local authorities. Um, in terms of RIDOR, which are reportable injuries where staff are off work for more than seven days or potentially need hospitalisation, we have seen an increase in numbers um, to 11. Um, majority of the increases were trips, slips and falls. And we look at this each of these cases in non-clinical risk committee that doesn't appear to be a pattern there. I just just do look like genuine uh, accidental injuries uh, that staff have uh, that staff have uh, had in the course of uh, in the course of their uh, daily uh, work. Um, from a fire perspective, we've had four visits from um, fire service, uh, all of which resulted in lowest level of risk um, being deemed in terms of the reports we got back from them, which is positive and overall it's the second year in the row that we've seen a reduction in fire related incidents within the organization um, in terms of funds and aggression obviously board will be aware there's quite a quite a level of work that's been done around this in terms of violence reduction groups breakthrough objectives at pph and work we're doing to reduce uh, physical restraint um, we've seen a reduction in um, physical assaults reported over the past year down 13 percent and non-physical assaults reduction of 14%. Um, within that, um, we have had a decrease as well in the number of hate crimes that have been reported, um, and the majority of those were at PPH. Um, again, worth mentioning, we have moved to a new reporting format as well. So as well of all the work that's been done, um, let's say we are taking into account that we have moved to or made some adaptations to our data system. So we are continuing to push to make sure that we are reporting all, all instances uh, correctly. In terms of training, um, fire awareness training, um, increased percentage um, over the course of the year. Uh, same with health and safety training. So uh, 
both up by half percent, one percent respectively, and we're still hitting our targets around manual handling and conflict resolution training. And I think just following up on Sally's point, sickness rates overall fell over the past year, and as mentioned, anxiety, sickness, depression, um, by far making up the highest proportion of uh, lost work days. Um, happy to happy to leave it there and answer any questions. Any questions? All right. Thanks very much, Paul. Very clear. Um, Rajiv, audit committee meeting, anything you wish to say? Uh, I think uh, we'll take it as read. Nothing special to call out for this month. Page 151 of the pack is where the minutes are. Thank you. Any questions? No? OK, I'll do uh, Council of Governors update. I suppose the main thing is that the Governor's Appointments and Remuneration Committee have uh, invited Mark to stay on for another year and Radio for another three years. Um, that will take Mark to his maximum nine years. So I'm sure we we welcome their decision and uh, thank you very much guys for continuing to support the trust um uh, the other thing is that um i think the governors are really interested in the quality data they're, they're taking there's a lot of data there a lot of detail which i think they find um, useful even if it's a bit overwhelming but i think there's a genuine desire to understand you know the quality issues which is a helpful triangulation for us paul use of the trust seal um, yes, so the uh, seal is attached to a uh, lease renewal for um, first floor at Thatcham Health Centre on, on Bath Road during the month. Okay, so we note that. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're nearly at the end of this session. Any uh, any other business you want to raise? Any other comments? Okay, the next uh, Trust Public Board is the 14th of May. Uh, uh, and now we'll adopt our normal resolution to exclude members of the press and public from the remainder of the meeting.